Hello everybody, my name is Wasim, and uh, today I'm going to uh, do a re-recording of a talk I gave at Trust a couple of months ago called Post-Clock Rationalizations. That is a play on words. Um, so the idea of a post-hoc rationalization is uh, where we arrive at an explanation for a phenomenon after the fact. And this uh, little kind of linguistic slip we've introduced here to from hoc to clock um, represents a kind of a thematic bundling of some of the work that I've been doing over the last few years and um, that will unfold in the coming moments. So um, this talk was given at Trust in October as part of the collective bodies um, events program and the theme for the month of October was the oracle. The oracle is the part of the ear external to the body made up of cartilage and skin with its curved shape collecting sound waves and delivering them to the inner ear. Detecting gravity and motion the ear is an integral part of how the body moves through its environment and thus shapes our relationship to time. Oracle and oracle share etymological roots in sound and speech acts. This month, or the month of October in the Trust Programme, we explored how the oracle stood in for time sensing, listening and manifestation of prophecy, thinking about the role of organisations in calling out to alternate horizons. And so just going to show you a few of the um, source materials of the um, work, published work that um, I've done over the last recent while uh, that have gone into the various strands of work that we'll be um, picking at today. So I write an editorial column at the Computational Law Report, which is an interdisciplinary journal based at the MIT Media Lab. There I am doing a cr an ed editorial uh, survey, chronological survey of um, misadventures in technology governance. You can see a, a screenshot of an upcoming uh, article there with a uh, weird meme about Pepe in the corner. I wrote for um, Spike Art Magazine's Web3 issue, a critique of uh, tokenized, uh, or, uh, tokenization of art and uh, digital um, scarcity. I wrote on the philosophy of time, in particular um, new technologically mediated forms of time, um, f as part of a nascent Time Zone 4 project, um, which was included in the Ljubljana Biennale of Graphic Arts. Um, I wrote an article called Necro Primitivism Rising, which was uh, included in the Philosophical Journal of Agorism, and that is about the social character, as I see it, of the cult of Bitcoin and its proof of work consensus mechanism. And uh, more recently, um, I co wrote with uh, two colleagues, Max Hampshire and Paul Zeidler, the uh, foreword to the book, the book version of Anna Greenspan's PhD thesis, Capitalism's Transcendental Time Machine. And then most recently, um, I wrote an article called Profit Motives and Nightwork States, uh, which is connecting some um, emerging organizational logics uh, to medieval history. More on that in a moment. So the first section of the talk is called Coordination Problem. And it starts off from the place that we live in. We live in a society, and those societies are pretty much run by market-based forms of capitalism. So there's a meme on the screen, financial growth, Exponential financial growth. Exponential financial growth on a planet with finite resources. And the bottom right-hand corner is a screenshot from a game called Universal Paperclips, where uh, you, the protagonist, the player, start off as a um, humble paperclip merchant, and you have strips of metal, and you click a button, and you turn them into paperclips. And after a while, you get tools, this thing scales up, and at uh, the end of the game, the logical endpoint is you are... Um, representing an army of hyperdimensional AIs that are stripping the universe for available resources. So this is how I see market-based capitalism writ large. It is an optimizing, exploring, and exploiting um, beast. And it doesn't really care about the externalities or the second-order effects. It just wants to optimize for whatever's in its objective functions. And the way that um, digital technology facilitates and mediates capital is very often in these kind of like network paradigms, whether those are physical networks, like for electronic communication, for example, moving uh, information or even value around, or the more, um, say, softer networks of relations, the societies uh, that we live in, we always seem to find these heterogeneities, these inequalities, these hierarchies, latent or implicit or explicit power structures. Oh, it's the Baudrillard checkpoint. Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Jean Baudrillard's uh, writing, especially around things like simulation and simulacra. And if you're not directly familiar with it, you might be familiar with it through um, films like The Matrix. So, uh, in some of Baudrillard's later work, 
um, in symbolic exchange and death, where he left behind this well-worn notion of the simulacrum, the kind of abstracted representation which surpasses the real, um, instead um, formulating in terms of um, semiotics and cool codes. So I'm going to read you a short excerpt. We now live in a world dominated by the free play of the monetary sign that is beyond reference to any reel of production or even a monetary referent in the form of a gold standard. In this world, the idea of a real value, of equities, of commodities, of houses, of anything, is meaningless, as what matters instead is not value per se, but infinite speculation. This new world is marked by the emergence of a brothel of capital, not for prostitution, but for substitution and commutation. And the way that Baudrillard sees um, this happening is through this three-stage genealogy or typology, where we start with things like raw commodity forms that we're familiar with, whether that's sacks of wheat or lumps of coal, and they get refined through labor, um, giving them social value. Um, and then the third step along this, this path to symbolic exchange and possibly death is the symbolic form where instead uh, these kind of these uh, raw commodities, these raw resources and the, the things which we act would labor acts upon to give value are replaced instead by cool codes, symbolic forms, meme economies. Take a look at the world around you. And uh, you'll see plenty of examples of that everywhere from GameStop to Dogecoin. Um, and so the collapse of commodity value forms a separation of capital from the class implosion of the social into the mass. So the replacing, replacement of the real or the, you know, the, um, the natural and the social with these semiotic codes is leading to context collapses as well as uh, value collapses. And so I want to then take a step from capital uh, to capitalism and then onto time. So I mentioned just briefly earlier that um, uh, Anna Greenspan's seminal PhD thesis, which came uh, out of the milieu, uh, the CCRU milieu uh, from Warwick in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, named Capitalism's Transcendental Time Machine, um, has taken on some new um, importance as technology has advanced and proliferated in our more recent uh, times. And so I want to start um, laying the groundwork for a kind of a series of homolog homologies or equivalences between capital, God, and time with a couple of quotes. So the first quote is from the foreword that I co-wrote with Max Hampshire and Paul Zeidler for the Greenspan uh, text. New conceptions of time can only ever be thought of in relation to emerging techno-capitalist apparatuses which themselves generate time, and it is the distribution, ordering, and arbitration of time that these apparatuses control. Capitalist time is ultimately born of strict equivalence with capital. Time equals money. My apologies, I said that we co-wrote that. Actually, that's from Anna's original uh, text, and we just uh, twisted it. And this is from a forthcoming book uh, called Profit Motives. Welt and Zauberum, via Weber and Schiller, anticipates the exfiltration of magic, sorcery, and the occult from the arena of divinity by upstart belief systems. In their place, other cultural rationalizations appear. Has the marketplace of ideology dethroned God with the demi-urgent efficiencies of precisely measured, regulated, and quantized time. In essence, time equals God. Welcome to the Renaissance. Now that's a funny word, Renaissance. Well, you might not have heard it before because I made it up. It's uh, what we call a bastard neologism, borrowing roots from Latin and Greek. So from Greek, we derive chronos, um, the measurement of precisely regulated time, and uh, naissance, as in renaissance, um, newness or renewal from Latin. Much like the word metaverse, which also mixes Latin and Greek roots, you might think of this as a bastard neologism. But anyway, let's run with it for a moment, because this idea of being able to um, synthesize and bring into life or like bring into the world new forms of um, keeping, measuring, regulating, or even synthesizing, creating time, uh, where this is going now. So we've got this two by two matrix on the screen of sorts uh, from the corporate surrealist, corporate surrealist vibe shift by Reality Spanner, an article. And it's a matrix of 
something things being real and things not being real, and it's money and time. So in the top left corner, we've got good old Hillary Clinton. She thinks that time is real and money is real. She's a corporate realist. And on the top right, we've got Emmanuel Kant, who thinks that money is real, but time isn't real. The bottom left, we've got uh, Gilles Deleuze, who thinks that money is not real, but time is real. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got Kanye West, who thinks that money ain't real and time ain't real. So he's the corporate surrealist. And I think the reason that Kanye is kind of our, whatever, quintessential example here of a mold breaker, a path breaker, is this idea of corporate surrealism tracking Kanye's, you know, wildly oscillating fortunes where he seems to uh, act very irrationally and torch large amounts of money and then be a pariah, be a complete outsider and then somehow come back and have a, you know, another moment in the sun and then do it again. So this is a very kind of surrealist way of building brands and capital. You're supposed to just accumulate this stuff um, rather than torch it and then like make these, you know, wild gestures. But anyway, it's an interesting uh, concept for us to hold on to. Um, but maybe we can chart the Renaissance from the top right to the bottom left, from Kant through Deleuze. And that's what Anna Greenspan uh, did in Capitalism's Transcendental Time Machine, where she first took um, Kant's transcendental move uh, to create the, this kind of like this uh, um, division between the inside and the outside. Um, and then to um, invert the su prior supremacy of space over time. So time is now the inner form and space is subservient to it. And the move that um, Greenspan made through Deleuze and Bergson is replacement of the concept of, um, so Kronos we mentioned earlier is this precisely regulated quantized kind of intentional uh, regular time, metric time. And um, Kairos is the Greek equivalent of the kind of experiential time, or the time which goes in circles, or the time which moves non-linearly, um, Greenspan replaced um, Kairos with Aeon. And uh, Aeon has been, in uh, Greenspan, like through Deleuze and Bergson, flattened Aeon into this imminent plane of intensities and multiplicities, rather than this kind of like hardly bound outside. So we've ended up with a kind of a, yeah, mishmash of a fusion of different uh, schools of philosophy to arrive at this this model. And once you've got this map, you can also plot real world events on it. So here's a map of Australia. And uh, we just uh, had the clocks changing from summer to winter time uh, in Berlin, not so long ago. Um, in Australia, if you look at the central part of Australia on the map in the top half of our Renaissance uh, compass, uh, it looks like some parts of Australia think time is real and some some of them don't. Some of them change for this DST and some of them don't. And that must make things quite complicated to navigate in that part of the world. And so the way that we um, represent time, the measurement of time, the flow of time um, in our legends and our myths also has evolved through the ages as the technologies of um, measuring, keeping these things have changed. So um, there is the Christian virtue of temperance um, which was um, very often initially displayed as a uh, woman or an ang angelic, female angelic figure, uh, holding two uh, uh, fluid vessels, two water vessels. And essentially what temperance is doing is measuring time through um, the observation of the flow of, of the fluids between these two. And so the flow is relatively linear. And so we can use that to make clocks. And indeed some of the first clocks we know about um, were water clocks in China, um, maybe more than 10,000 years ago. And so that was the first, you know, our first idea of re the representation of the, the, you know, temperance as a virtue, as in patience, as in mastery over time. Um, and uh, the way that it's been represented over time uh, has also changed. So the hourglass supplanted the water clock. Um, and then in the 16th century, this is these are two images from Heinrich Suso's The Wisdom of the Clock, mid 16th century. Um, temperance is now pictured with mechanical clocks. So what I haven't seen yet, and um, this is an open request to you out there, um, I would like to see temperance wielding some of the contemporary timekeeping and uh, uh, time creating technologies of today. So um, here's an example. These are a bunch of lasers. This is a clock that I used to operate um, when I was doing my PhD in photophysics. Uh, we're using lasers to probe the 
um, inner secrets of matter at very short timescales. So you start the clock by giving a system a huge amount of energy, and then you vary the ticking of the clock by optically delaying the arrival of a second laser by sending it the long way round, if you like. And the squiggles, the straight lines, are us starting the clock, and the squiggles are the kind of the ticking of the hands, I guess you could say. This is a Jablonski diagram, if anyone's interested. And so let's say something about time back in the real world, because I think it probably won't have escaped many of you that um, if someone has the kind of authority or you know entity has the authority of regulating and setting the time, the co power comes with that because we measure productivity and very often you know capital in terms of time. Many of us get paid by the hour, for example. So here's another quote from uh, from Greenspan. These technologies shape and are shaped by the production logics of capitalism. The clock, enabling autonomous timekeeping, synchronized industrial production, and transport systems, meanwhile acting as both an instrument and a symbol of power and authority. The introduction of global temporal standards, such as GMT, time zones, DST, and net network mediated machinic temporalities, all serve to imbue timekeeping practices with greater pre precision and universality. And indeed, in the few weeks since um, this talk was first recorded, um, some more of the um, locations and situations where uh, time has been used as a mechanism of domination um, have come back into the public eye. Um, so uh, things like GMT were kind of like unilateral impositions of an empire um, uh, forcing the rest of the world to adhere to its temporal logics. And one thing that not as many people know about not that many people know about is that a GMT was not accepted by the French at the time. Um, and the Paris mean time, which is about nine minutes uh, different to, to Greenwich mean time, as I recall, um, was a thing for a while. So yeah, whoever chooses the time or gets to set the time, they have power in that, uh, in that regime. And um, yeah, Ireland and Palestine, also very interesting examples of uh, colonial powers setting the clocks, setting the time, and also not only that, building these large phallic clock towers as symbols of control, power, and domination. And indeed, where's the largest clock tower in the world today? Well, that's it on the slide now. It's in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so these uh, giant phallic protrusions, which uh, seem to be uh, symbols of uh, dominant power, um, still uh, fracture our skylines uh, in the name of um, temporal hegemony. Okay, Y2K checkpoint. Well, that's that's interesting. So Y2K, a lot of people thought nothing happened when 1999 became 2000, and uh, there were um, lamentations of incoming doom, impending doom, the, the apocalypse was about to come, the end was nigh, and then nothing happened, or did it? Um, so maybe planes didn't fall out of the sky, and maybe servers didn't roll over because they're two-digit year address space went from 99 to zero rather than 100, and they did that in a graceful sense. But some people, including Greenspan, argue that Y2K was instead an, aeonic, an event in the aeonic plane rather than the plane of our direct experiences. And Y2K paved the way for the ascendance of machinic temporalities, for new kinds of time which hold more in common with machine logics than those of the clock and the calendar that we've been habituated to using for the, um, you know, since time began, or at least since we started measuring it. And so, the, uh, what I see in Y2K, and also in Unix time, which is a related uh, way of measuring time digitally, is that we're trying to make, with com computers, we're using clocks as computers to make finite representations of the ineff in ineffable and infinite nature of the flow of time. So, within the moment of Y2K, there was present an understanding that the machinery of networks and digital computation facilitates new potentials for universalities and totalities. All of the techno-economic affordances of virtual capital flows are rendered achievable through the proliferation of chronometers for cyberspace in the ascendant since Y2K. Digital timekeeping at scale began in earnest at the dawn of the 1970s with the creation ex nihilo of Unix time. So Unix time is a very simple concept. It's a 32-bit uh, address like 32-digit number, basically, 
It started on the 1st of January 1970, and every second of Earth time increments up one. So this is a way of digitally representing the time of the clock and the calendar and the sun. And again, we're using finite digital memory to try and address this. So Y2K runs out of space in 2038, and some people are calling this the apocalypse, the next Y2K. And so just bear that in mind. There was going to be maybe another Y2K panic within the next 15 years. Uh, but there are other kinds of digital timekeeping systems that have appeared since Anna Greenspan's uh, pioneering work in the, at the turn of the millennium. And some people, myself included, have been calling them time machines for quite some, quite some time now. And uh, that those are namely yeah, blockchain technologies, uh, which have been used to architect things like a crypt the cryptocurrency uh, Bitcoin and the uh, generalized computation platform uh, Ethereum. So um, here's a couple of visualizations of the clock of Bitcoin. This is a stochastic clock, a thermodynamic clock. It is um, run in a decentralized way through this proof of work consensus mechanism, the Bitcoin mining that I'm sure you've heard of. And um, this enables the network to reach consensus roughly once every 10 minutes, uh, issue a block, like a page of the ledger, the transactions happening on this financial network, and then the process starts again. And the process is, this consensus is achieved through the burning of enormous quantities of energy. That is the price of running this decentralized clock. I'm sure you've heard about the energy consumption of Bitcoin. We will get to that um, in a little moment. And so what I see in Bitcoin's stochastic clock is we're now using the computer as the clock rather than the clock as the computer. And so I just want to wrap up this little exploration of, of time with the, um, the end of the foreword that I wrote with a couple of friends for the Greenspan text. One speculation seems uncontroversial, that capital and those entities in the service of it will continue to desire, enact, and exploit ever-grander conceptions and architectures of temporal engineering. For as long as there's value to be redistributed, there will be incentives to engineer more sophisticated machinery with which to manipulate the nature and the flow of time. And now I want to segue into um, the other side of the Bitcoin thing. And we're going to talk about the ideology of scarcity that this thing brings. So I just said that Bitcoin's a decentralized clock. Wow, doesn't that sound amazing? Well, the problem, the, the quality of a clock is measured by how well regulated its ticks are, like how um, evenly spaced are its gradations. And so the way that Bitcoin keeps this clock ticking relatively consistently is by recalibrating the likelihood of a cycle of computation, one of these proofs of work, these bits of mining, uh, to find a block one of these lottery tickets to win the lottery, those probabilities get rescaled to ensure that the blocks don't come too quickly if more um, computational power uh, joins the network. But the, the, the upshot of that is the Bitcoin will never know satiety. It is insatiable. It will never have enough energy. If you give it more energy, it will just recalibrate and it always wants more because the security of the network depends on this huge amount of energy going into to um, uh, create a deterrent for other people to not put more, even more energy in and change the history of the network. So Bitcoin is the highest maintenance clock in the universe for some reason, according to this crass meme on the slide. And so I'm sure you've heard and seen the news and this you know, much ink and hot air has been spilled on the ecological impact of things like Bitcoin and its mining. Um, and the latest studies seem to suggest that the climate impact of Bitcoin is so large now that it is now surpassed gold mining. You know, when we dig holes in the ground to get this precious metal out of it and pump the ground full of chemicals, it's now worse than that. So the only thing left for Bitcoin to, to supplant as a kind of a carbon uh, sink is beef, cattle farming. And it's interesting to note that uh, Bitcoin, gold and beef, there's already some kind of like golden triangle between these things because they're core tenets of the of the um, desirable lifestyles of the canonical Bitcoin believer. Um, they're very much into their stakes and their gold, digital or analog, and their Bitcoin. There's also this uh, libertarian streak running through Bitcoin. Um, and it makes the people in it very individualistic and very selfish and uh, unwilling to reckon with the externalities of the system that they're interested in. Um, and that ends up with, you get kind of this extremely ideological people saying things like, coal is good, we use coal to green the planet. Um, so that's, you know, you can find a lot of this discussion on uh, Bitcoin Twitter, for example. What I think of these as are pretty good examples of this concept from Kara Daggett, 
called Petro Masculinity. I'm just going to read you a little quotation about this. As the planet warms, new authoritarian movements in the West are embracing a toxic combination of climate denial, racism and misogyny. Petro Masculinity appreciates the historic role of fossil fuel systems in buttressing white patriarchal rule as anxieties aroused by the Anthropocene augment desires for authoritarianism. Petro masculinity suggests that fossil fuels mean more than profit. They contribute to making identities. Through a psychopolitical reading of authoritarianism, fossil fuel use can function as a violent reactionary practice. And there's so many examples of this in Bitcoin. I won't elaborate uh, now in the interest of time, but um, here's an example of somebody that is trying to dig up a uh, municipal landfill in the UK to try and find a hard drive, which uh, he says contains billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And um, the Bitcoiners sometimes dress themselves up as religious knights, things like that. Um, more on that later. But um, I want to talk now very briefly at the end about uh, New Wild Wests and the profits which might lead us to those promised lands, these new colonialisms. And so in the world of cryptocurrencies, which is a natively horizontalized space without many formal leaders, loads of people have just showed up and put on suits or crowns or wreaths of thorns and started acting like they're the chosen, blessed, anointed ones, which I think is very interesting. Um, but it's not always dudes. Um, here's a very well-known um, woman that was in the cryptocurrency space for a while, Ruja Ignatova from OneCoin, who I believe is now one of the most wanted people by the FBI on the planet. So if you know where she is, let the FBI know. Um, girl power. And so I want to just say something very briefly about this um, profit motives uh, work, which ties together all of this. And so that it's the, prof the job of the profit to lead us to the promised land. Uh, remember that. For as long as there's been financial capital, risk and speculation have orbited, manipulated and harnessed it. As narrative feedback machines, simultaneously reading and rewriting realities, markets exist as a distributed conversation among speculators driven by profit motives and an appetite for divination and prophecy. Today, new strains of techno-colonialism are emerging, which are the latest of a series of echoes throughout Western history. An ascendant cabal of elites are attempting to reshape the world in their favour, whilst hiding in plain sight behind the faceless technologies that have enriched them. Theirs is a Promethean zealotry without faith, affecting an aura of design sanction for purposes of elevating the ego, enriching the chosen ones, and crafting empires of varying stripes. But was it not always so? And so the prophets lead us to the promised land, but today there is no more land. So what do we do? Where do we go? Well, I think we have to make it. That seems to be what the, the new trend is. But just to say that this is nothing new. This has been going on since the, the post-Columbus colonialization of um, the Americas and Africa and so on. Um, very often people from the old world would go make deals with tribal leaders in exchange for protection from the, um, the colonial misadventures of the crowns and then go back to their homelands and say, I'm the king of territory X, buy stocks in my company. And this is kind of what's happening again now, although it's happening in a more, let's say, um, dematerialized way. A lot of this is happening uh, in metaverses or uh, in small pieces of land. You might have heard about uh, things like Satoshi Island or the MSC Satoshi cruise ship or there's all these like weird island projects. El Salvador is trying to make a Bitcoin city. Um, there are things like Praxis and LF um, and Urbit, all kind of um, seemingly plowing this kind of neo-secessionary horizon. And so let's ask ourselves why this might be. I'll introduce this concept called the Nightwork State. Today's tech overlords are the descendants of Europe's crusaders, well-financed, zealous fanatics wreaking destruction on the planetary other in the name of their greater good. The Vatican-sponsored waves of Levantine invasions that began in the late 11th century were the midwife of capitalism, colonialism, and technology as we know it today. With the Network State organizational concept, a cadre of powerful ideologues blessed with tokenized wealth are toying with the prospect of reshaping national frontiers, mirroring the desires of Frankish noblemen and their knightly orders in the Levant a thousand years ago. I just want to unpack this network state concept for a moment before we before we wrap. Um, so this is a concept that's come out of some work by uh, Balaji Srinivasan from the last few years, although these ideas have been floating around, these kind of like neo-secessionary, like build a citadel, build a castle, buy an island, these kinds of ideas of escaping 
of uh, withdrawing from the disenchantment of society. So this is a quote from the Network State book from 2022. The net a network state is a social network with a moral innovation, a sense of national consciousness, a recognized founder, a capacity for collective action, an in-person level of civility, an integrated currency, cryptocurrency, a consensual government limited by a social smart contract, an archipelago of crowdfunded physical territories, a virtual capital, an on-chain census that proves enough, large enough population income and real estate footprint to attain a measure of diplomatic recognition. So for me, the, the, the really problematic part of that is this recognized founder, because I feel like that's reprising the kingdoms and the feudal um, structures of before. So here's a diagram which I tried to make um, for a recent article where I was trying to understand how aligned communities, guilds, charter cities, network states, and nation states might convert between each other through the actions of uh, capital and legitimacy, in essence. But you can also then plot onto these things different kinds of characteristics. So my concern about this recognized founder requirement of the, of the Bellagian network state, you can then start to think about whether these founders are credible or not, and whether they're neutral or not. So we can then start to build compasses and maps uh, layering these compasses. And so I just want to wrap with this with saying, it's not all bad news. Uh, we can join the nonprofit sector. And there are ways that we can mitigate um, these tendencies towards the, um, the, uh, the people that already have all the power, the people that desire more power from getting it. And I will wrap here. Hashi says, thanks for listening, Meatbag. Now plug me in.